Right, so we are back. And now the next thing we're going to do is discuss APL in the industry. And for that, uh, we have a panel uh, with some new people. And Alexander is here. And do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So um, I am a life insurance actuary. So I, live, uh, I work in the domain of uh, life insurance. I've been um, professionally working with APL since 2017. I'm currently working at um, the Virium Insurance Group, which is a um, rather big German um, life insurer. And the APL system I'm working on is a, um, it's a calculation engine, um, which we use um, for testing the mathematical correctness of um, insurance benefits and uh, premiums and, and life insurance. Cool. Josh? Yeah, my name is Josh uh, David. I've been working as a consultant now for about five years through Dialog. And I started off working in a small company, so a small APL company, you know, a handful of employees. Um, and now I work in a a very large company using APL. So I've been on sort of both sides of the spectrum there and continue to use APL fairly regularly to uh, make production tools. Good. Mark? I am uh, Mark Wolfson. I work for a company called Big, which we are in the uh, jewelry industry. And we provide uh, software and consulting solutions to jewelry retailers and manufacturers to make their businesses more efficient and profitable. We have a an eight uh, developer staff for developing software of them, and we use a lot of mixed technologies. Uh, most it, Everything is uh, Windows-based, but we use uh, .NET and C Sharp uh, our application is a, a web-based application. It's a web app. And we're using APL to do, um, well, to do more and more things, but a lot of um, importing, exporting of data, manipulation of data. And more recently, we are actually developing uh, web pages using Dialog. Cool. Um, what about you, Josh? And how many people are working in the APL by where you're working now? So now I would say we have about uh, 20 APL developers um, in all sorts of different organizations, but yeah. And Alexander? Um, it depends a bit um, how you count. Um, so we have uh, five to six internal APL um, developers, but we usually um, amend our uh, our team with, with external consultants. Um, for example, Finn, who's also on the panel here, um, um, works together with me. Um, yeah. So, in the fin, are you always on that team as an external consultant or are you working with other people as well? Um, no, these days I'm, I'm always on, on a team as an external consultant. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But you're from a consultant company that has, uh, has many APL developers that go out to various companies? Yes. So, I mean, many, I don't really know. Um, um, less less than 10 so i don't know if, if you would call it many or not but yeah quite a handful of people yeah my, my comment... father said you you only need about a tenth as many programmers if they're using apl as other languages so maybe it's like a team of 100 uh, yeah. sorry josh that no that was going to be my comment is <laughs> it for people who don't use apl as much that might seem like a it, it's hard to make a comparison you know 10 developers doesn't seem well it, it's not that massive for a company but you know there's companies that have three or four APL developers that are pushing out industry standard products. And probably two. Or two. <laughs> two. Yeah, for yeah. me, uh, I don't do consulting at my company. I mostly do data engineering stuff like uh, uh, processing, processing uh, our company's uh, database and uh, uh, doing some checks. And uh, for that, uh, uh, I, I work with my senior, Richard Proctor, who is uh, in the attendees. And uh, yeah, that's a, we are a, a two-man powerhouse at our company. <laughs> but doing the work, work of 20. Yeah, I don't... Um, 
we we work on a lot of different API uh, things, tools, and so on at that. Like they're not whole applications, but productivity tools mostly for people. By far, most things are just worked on by one person. Uh, sometimes a couple of people. Um, but actual APL coding is usually not more than a couple of people, uh, which is interesting. Also, in it, it changes which kind of tools uh, you need, and when you are so few people working together, and the whole idea about collaborative editing thing doesn't and messing up people's changes with each other it doesn't really come in very much. Um, but let's see, we have a couple of questions here, and. If, Test-driven development is the question we've gotten. And I certainly, in some of the things I do at Dialog, some of those tools do test-driven uh, development. And any others of you uh, do that? And and there's also the question of, of how to do it in APL, which I can come back to. Or you just write correct code from the outset, so there's no point, I guess. <laughs> no? Yeah, it's uh, one thing that's interesting is it's it's a good practice obviously to do but in a lot of the domains that we looked about like in um where where people are using apl who aren't really software programmers you know they might be a chemist or something else where these types of software engineering principles don't aren't um you know natural to them so you do have to take there there's some time you have to do to to introduce these these principles to them so i, th I think there are some there's a there's a few tools coming out uh, that that people use to do test driven development. One of them that we're using in Dialog is CETA, which is like a continuous integration type of tool that you can write your test cases and it launch. Now, when because we have these cloud architectures, it's easy to launch a bunch of interpreters with different uh, you know different versions, different architectures to to test your APL code that way. And there's a, f a few test test um, libraries out there that you could use to, to help you run tests, but it, it is also really easy and simple to make your own test uh, right. suite in APL. It's, you know, we have uh, a lot of a lot of tests that I've seen that are written in APL are just a simple defund, which, uh, you know, want, if it's true or false, you just test a Boolean expression and then exit report. It takes like three lines of code to write your own test framework in APL. So many people just do that. I've I've seen a a, a really uh, knowledgeable advanced APLer uh, say and uh, saying which test framework does he use uh, for APL and his answer is match uh, just that this yeah. this one symbol that uh, that doesn't equality but it's a it's a full equality so if you have a whole array and um, of values it matches up everything. Um, and and in a way that's that's really true. The, the, the tests will eventually be built on a match somewhere. And some of the things I do with internally a dialogue, and we have a test suite if you can call it, just a bunch of of situations that are being set up, and then some things actions being taken, and then testing some and uh, uh, state see if if things happen that like they were supposed to to happen. We got the expected uh, result, and then. There's a little bit of plumbing about it and to make it nicer to use, but it's just a few lines of APL code. And I tend to implement a little, a custom APL DSL for the testing to cut down on the amount of code in every test. So I might write some otherwise dodgy APL code that like look, looks at some global values and maybe set some updates, some, some semi global and things so that each test can be written as concisely as possible. Just does this value include this or match that or and so on? Um, so it's, it can definitely um, be done, but often I think it's bespoke. And there's also a question as to uh, the environment we work on. So APL is a bit special because it has often very tight integration between the development environment and the um, the language itself. Do you live inside your APL interpreter's uh, interactive session, or do you use additional tools outside as well? So, um, if my if I may answer, so um, in our case, we really very much work inside the session. So that's really our um, central work area, essentially, right? I mean, we use Link, so um, everything is um, 
also under version control, so our whole code and but but we really work in the session and that's kind of like um like our shell essentially, right? right. So um we have a more or less open system, at least for the developers. So we really um also um, try try things out inside the session and stuff like that. There was also a question about um what debug debuggers uh, you use uh, I should I should say we we use dialog APL. I mean, it has a um, an integrated debugging or tracing environment, which is which is really nice. I mean, you can really step into functions and look um, how um, everything is processed line by line, essentially. So, um, which is very important for our um, use case because um, we are testing um, yeah mathematical calculations against the productive um, uh, computational engine. Uh, so sometimes we want to to check whether um, for what reason, for example, we get a, a different result than uh, the productive system, and so it's very nice to see um, our calculations so to to check them step by step, and it's really integrated into into the whole um, um, yeah system essentially. I mean, it's it's really a, a closed system where you can. Uh, so I mean, it's 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 a tightly integrated system where you can really do all the work in yes. I would also yes. say. Yeah, I would also say that the uh, we also put all of our code in text files. So we use link to to uh, bring different parts of the code into the active workspace that's running. And we found that to be much, much more efficient and much easier to have source control and to pass code between each other. But then we do use the the workspace when we're developing I would say that that's one of the most one of the tools that Dialog provides that makes the the coding process so much more efficient than in other languages because we're always working with different APIs inbound and different APIs outbound and the fact that we can play around with different commands and different URLs and different statements to see what's working and what's not working and to refine the actual final code before it actually goes into uh you know a, a function that has to get compiled built and run just to see that it wasn't exactly the right thing makes us so much more efficient than than we otherwise would be i should give a little bit of background here because being that we are we're trying to cater to a a new apl audience and we even did a poll on uh on people's uh, experience and uh, in general uh, those that are listening here are not uh, haven't uh, seen very much of APL. So what's going on with Link and the workspaces? Traditionally, APL has used these binary blobs, just a, a collection and not human readable file uh, containing everything that you're doing in the APL. It could be a whole application, it could be tools, uh, both uh, values, lookup tables, and your uh, actual code. And these days, we want to keep things in text file. And there, we have a tool at uh, Dialog, ships with Dialog, called Link. That's what Alexander and Mark are referring to, which makes sure to synchronize between text files and uh, what's in memory and reflected in what we can call the workspace. So we, we might not actually save the workspace to an, a real file. We just keep it in memory until it's time to distribute an application, if that's something that we do. Um, so that's what they're uh, talking about. I would add that uh, one of the other side benefits of using Link and having your code in text files, a couple a couple of benefits that I can I can bring up. One is that you can you can also use other tools to to look at at, at debug and run your code. So we use VS Code some as well to um, to do some development, um, not to run the code or to execute it, but to search different places and to make global changes. And those kinds of things are super easy to do in in VS Code. So that's definitely a nice benefit. Another nice benefit is that a lot of uh, our code is kind of version independent. So when version 19 just came out, we didn't, since we don't save the workspaces anyway, and we're just bringing in code as long as we haven't used you know any any things that are in say 19 that wouldn't be in 18 it doesn't really matter which version we use to run to run our code so it that that's become come a a nice advantage for us as well 
Ah, yeah, it's you can. It's not just backwards compatible, but actually backwards portable. Where normally exactly. you can only port forwards. If you if you save the workspace, you wouldn't be able uh, to do that. Um, there's a question of whether there are IDE like features that uh, you miss. So everybody here um came from other programming backgrounds, which means you've also had other environments you're working in. Um, and and uh, there's also a question as to automated refactorings. Uh, but being that I'm an APL only person, you have to fill me in on what I even what's even meant by that. Uh, there's a little bit in the dialog ID that's called refactor in a class where you can change a, very, a field to an, a property and, and other things. Not that I've ever seen anybody actually use that. But are there are there features that you've experienced outside of APL that that you miss? Yeah. Uh... Then key bindings. So like, huh. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I'm not sure if uh, that's a, it's, it's a, the idea of a model editing is a, uh, is uh, not popular, but uh, yeah, it's, but I think it's a little more well known than APL. So the idea is that uh, in, in there, in, when you're editing code, uh, you are, you type something and it shows up. So that's a, that's a mode. Uh, for the insert mode, but uh, in traditional editing, there's a, oh, we are always in insert mode. But uh, there's a there's another way to think about editing where you have uh, a you are not always inserting. You can also switch a mode where you you are just uh, focus, focused on navigating the code and someone refactoring the code. Uh, in in and then you can have a feature. You can have a dedicated modes or functionalities that uh, helps you. Uh, Refactor code, and that, that's what uh, Vim is about. It's a uh, it's a uh, using using two modes as entity. That's a uh, so that's uh, not uh, built into a dialog editors. But uh, there's but uh, in in the new in another in the the remote editor the the remote IDE ride. Uh, there there is it's not built that the key is not built in, but uh, that uh, the framework itself. The editor framework itself can support uh, Vim bindings, so I I just uh, plug the Vim bindings into into Rider myself, and uh, I can I can uh, bring back what I missed. Oh, okay, that's that's cool. Yeah, that's it's an interesting thing about the the Ride uh, interface, is that it's it's easily hackable. It's not hasn't been bundled up into some binary thing. You can go in and change anything. I also have done. I wanted a different font and it didn't support it at the time, so I could just hack that in. Um, and there's also a feature in in Ride where you, whenever it wants to open an editor, you can ask it to open an external editor. And it's slightly awkward because it requires you to close the external editor for it to pick up the changes. It doesn't register that you just save the file from inside the editor, but it is such, there is such a thing. But may, maybe Max, you can uh, contribute to Ride so that we can have like a Vim mode in Ride. If it's yeah, uh, I have uh, made a pull request uh, on the Ride repo and adding adding that feature as an extension, even though extensions aren't officially supported for Ride. Right, right. But that's definitely something that uh, we could look into. Um, One thing that would that could be useful too, Adam, is uh, I I noticed that in Notepad plus plus it understands lots of different programming languages and SQL and there's plugins for all kinds of things, but there isn't a dialogue plugin. I'm wondering that it, that would probably be useful because we do look at APL code since it, they are in text files. We do use a lot of different editors for, um, for uh, looking at code and, and uh, quickly changing things or passing them from one person to another. So that might be a useful thing as well. Yeah, I've been, uh, I've been, I use Nova Plus Plus myself as well. Uh, usually it's for APL code, and there are some issues where it doesn't, some things in Unicode, it doesn't quite understand, but there are other plugins that kind of add that functionality. Definitely something we can look into. Um, but that's mostly when you, as you say, we have mixed things and you want them in the same editor. One thing I've been missing personally is uh, rectangular editing. And there are some rudimentary parts of that in the in the dialogues interfaces, but not solid. And it's very good in in especially in the plus plus plus, but also in VS Code. Um, okay. 
so you use APL in your company, but does everyone also use not APL together with that? Or you have systems that are just entirely APL from top to bottom? In our case, it's uh, it's interesting because we have subsystems that are completely APL. When you have, we have subsystems that are completely C sharp and .NET, and then we have hybrid systems that actually mix the technologies and kind of use the best of both the best of both worlds uh, in a mixed environment. Which so it's 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 pretty useful. And so, if you want to add some new feature. Do you reach for APL or do you gonna it's a look good, at what are you yeah? It's a good question. A lot of it depends on who's who's available. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we have uh because we have developers, you know, for both. So obviously the APL team is super productive. And if it if it's if it's something that involves data or data manipulation or um those kinds of things, then it's always APL. Or if it in, involves customization on a per user or per per company basis, then we also exclusively use APL. If it's an API inbound, sometimes we'll use one and sometimes we'll use the other. And if it's an outbound, same thing. If it's a new page, lately we've been we've been doing using Dialog for for new pages, but obviously there's also modifications and enhancements to existing pages that that happen and and it, that will depend on on what the technology of the page is max you're in a very small team right, of two people so does that mean that you only use apl or do you also hook it together with other things um for yeah for a good while uh we were just uh, using apl to keep track of our our data but uh, uh since i joined uh with uh, being migrating uh, our uh, apl data onto sql and uh, there's a dialogue interface for SQL, which uh, we uh, make a very good use of. We also do. I see. Yeah. And uh, Alexander and Finn, the, the systems you're working on, the what about that? Modules, all APL, what is it? So we mostly use APL. So I should say we, um, so this, uh, the system is um, nearly or roughly a decade old and it was originally written in APL2, um, mm -hmm. which had some problems with integration um, with, um, so everything. reading and data and with, yeah, with everything. Right. <laughs> um, so we have parts which are written in Excel VBA and we have small parts which are written in PowerShell, but um, for new developments, we try to get rid of that and uh, really work with APL because um, Dialog APL essentially has all the integrations we need and it can also do scripting. So there's not really a reason to reach for PowerShell in most cases. I mean, it must has to has to be a very, very special case so that we um, uh, would build some some new PowerShell parts um, in the future. So we are really trying to, to work in, um, exclusively in APL, yes. And what about you, Josh? You're a very large company and also lots of APL is there. Yeah. So, I mean, there's the whole, uh, there's many projects. Some are completely written in APL from the back end to the front end, which is also one of the key points of why APL is part of its success is because it allows you to make a full stack application very easily without having to um, be a programmer, really. You could be a domain specialist and, and write a GUI with APL because the GUI framework is pretty simple. I mean, it's sort of array oriented. I mean, it's object oriented, but there's array elements to it and a lot and this, of math. This is all under Windows. Right. Or... Under Windows, which a lot of enterprise systems have. And that was one question asked, which is how yeah. do you champion the adoption of APL in Windows Enterprise? Um, I think that's another thing is APL integrates so well with other languages. For example, you can have an Excel front end VBA call an APL engine in the background, or you can turn an APL component into a .NET object and then consume that from your C sharp code. So, or, and now it's just getting better with um, web services too. You can have an, an APL server that just you know takes endpoints and returns data back, or the other way around, where you uh, where you're consuming other APIs built by your company in, in different languages now with a 
HTTP. It's easy to interface. And yeah, I, and so APL is used for whole projects or just a small calculation. And also a lot of, uh, there's a lot of C library consumption as well with quad NA as a system function in APL where you can leverage, you know, if there's an optimization routine or something for scientific calculations that you don't want to write the source code for, or you, you have access to a DLL, you can consume that easily from APL. And we also have, you know, the, the number of interfaces is growing. There's also a Python interface too. Um, if you need to leverage one of the many libraries that are available there. There's an inter interface to R as well, if you need right. these kind of uh, conversations. But the .NET interface is probably the easiest to use in APL, I think, because that comes built in, and there's right. a lot of functionality available there at your fingertips. And lots of libraries mm -hmm. exist, yeah. We've, I think that's, we've that's created one... a... Oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead, uh, Alexander. I want to say, I think that's one of the selling points for APL, I guess, because um, it is really self-contained, right? I mean, you can just... Um, I mean, you can just get Dialog APL, um, get it running in uh, the Windows environment, even on Citrix or um, on a virtual machine or um, whatever. And you don't have to um, uh, import some libraries or, or stuff like that, what you have to do um, with many other um, programming languages. I mean, it has a lot of built-in functionality. Um, all this interface, uh, the .NET uh, bridge, for example, I mean, it comes um, packaged in and um, also, you have a lot of these um, system functions, which is a nice thing um, to to interact with different types of data and write out different types of data, which is really nice. So you can really uh, get working immediately. I mean, I, I think it's um, especially valuable for domain experts um, who are really not uh, not doing uh, so much of, of software development in the big sense, but really want to to get problems solved because you can can really start solving problems immediately, essentially. The two Mark. things that, that we found to be unbelievably um, useful in working in a mixed environment, one is that the C sharp side of our of our um, development uses a lot of external DLL packages to do Excel or to do to uh, interpret um, fields on a PDF page or all kinds of different. Um, packages. And what we found is that we can connect to those same exact DLL packages exactly the way they do. And just so that everything is, is exactly consistent across our development team so that we're all using the same external tools. So the fact that we can connect to external DLL packages is super helpful. The other thing is that we we have, as Josh mentioned, we set up a, a web service so we can make internal API calls from the web app. So whether the, either way, the front end is running JavaScript and whether it's calling an endpoint that lives on a, a uh, dialogue web service or whether it's living someplace else, the, the Java doesn't really care. It just cares that it's sending uh, a your uh, an API request. It's giving a payload and returning a result. So we can actually have dialog endpoints living side by side with C sharp endpoints, and and everything is is in harmony. So it's working in that in that mixed environment. You really need to have that kind of interoperability that that we have, and it it, it works very seamlessly. Well, you're you're the boss of your company, so I guess you can just dictate people that the APL should be involved. But have you had Non APL, they say C sharp people protest and have to like convince them that it's good to have APL involved there, and and if so, how? I, I would say I don't use that that leverage, um, <laughs> even though obviously I have that leverage, but I don't use it. So you know, we we work back and forth with the obviously I I advocate for my case, but but uh, you know, but the 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 C, the C sharp people have have just as much of a voice as I do. Okay. There was oh, no, there was one ahead, comment Josh. about moving parts too. How APL systems are self-contained, and uh, which is a lot of people agree with that, and they like to use APL because it has the full stack, and they don't need to depend on you know other libraries and worry about any security risks that happen with that. It's very easy to vet an APL package if you need to use it. You can read the whole package usually. Um, Another, that might be another good selling point for APL in large companies that 
um, a lot of languages, they seem to be in a fad and you don't know if they'll be there in five years or 10 years. But the interesting thing with APL is it has this stable history of decades of use where, you know, and it's been extremely backwards compatible. So a lot of companies can just rely on that being there. It's the, the same code that ran 50 years ago it can run usually unmodified or with tiny modifications. I've tried it myself now 50 years later, and there's no particular reason why it wouldn't still run in 50 years. It's it feels here to stay. Okay, well, um, that's it for um, discussing APL in Enterprise. Of course, you can keep asking questions in the in the chat in the Q and A uh, while I'm talking for the last few minutes.